Um, I originally started with this research um, as an undergrad, so like 20-something years ago. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it kind of started out as um, I, I was doing some research for a college professor, Dr. Jerry Milanich. I'm sure some of you have heard his name in archaeology. And um, he had an interest in Cuban fishing ranches in Charlotte Harbor. And um, a few months into my research, um, my mother, Mary Ann Almy, who's an archaeologist, said, I'm almost positive that I have a skeleton in the closet. Um, it's a great way to start a, a conversation um, that might be from a Cuban fishing rancho. And I said, tell me more. And um, thus began a several year journey of researching Cuban fishing ranchos um, and skeletons. And um, while I've moved away from the topic in many ways, it still holds a special place in my heart. Um, so there are some images of skeletons in here at one point, but they are not Native American. I just wanted to give you the heads up. So um, just a brief timeline of the Cuban fishing ranchos. So these ranchos occurred um, predominantly along the southwest coast of Florida from Tampa to Key West. Um, although there may have been some up the East Coast, but they're less well known. And in the end, the East Coast isn't as suitable um, because of the, the deep drop offs and the strong currents. We have much better fishing areas over here for mullet and things, which is what they were wanting. Um, in the 1670s, we get the first mention of fishing ranchos. The Jesuit missionaries and things would mention them as they were traveling up the coast on boats from Cuba. Um, and then in 1743, we kind of get the first visits um, and discussions of them. Um, and to put this into U.S. history, because that keeps popping up, um, you know, we become independent in 1776. Um, and a few years later, we end up having the first Seminole Wars, which come up again. Um, those were predominantly in Georgia and North Florida. And this is when the Seminole, who were the Creek at the time, start to get pushed into the state. Um, and then in 1821, Florida becomes a U.S. territory, um, and instantly um, Andrew Jackson starts going after the not only the Native Americans, but the Cuban fishermen um, and other people. Um, and then in 1835, we have the Second Seminole War, um, and the ranchos end up playing kind of a big role in the Second Seminole War in some ways, and then ultimately in attempting to prevent the Third Seminole War, um, and then they just sort of fade off into the sunset. Um, and that's when we start to see many of the European American settlers coming in and they become fishermen and they fish in many of the same ways. Um, but the original Cuban fishermen sort of disappear. Um, these fishermen, uh, I have a picture of the, the Native Americans up there, the Calusa, because we do think that originally they were interacting with the Calusa and many of the fishing techniques are quite similar. And so they were probably working with those Native Americans that were here um, to, to harvest fish and transport them. Um, but they would catch and salt and then smoke and dry the mullet, um, which were then transported back to Cuba. They would often smoke them over corn cobs um, and, and salt them down. They also apparently pickled and dried and pressed the roe. And apparently it was quite the delicacy in Cuba. Um, the fishing season was predominantly from March to August, which coincides with those good Catholic Spaniards down there in Cuba. Um, and it was Lent. And so since we can't eat meat, we can eat dried fish, right? And so that is where the fishermen made most of their money was in that time of the year. Um, and Florida really became an essential location because by the early 1700s, they really had overfished the Cuban waters at this point, and they were starting to have to expand out to find fish for them. Um, and so, you know, in the very beginning, in the early 1700s, they're probably coming up here in March, heading back in August. But definitely into the 1800s, they're starting to say, this Florida is pretty nice, kind of like the snowbirds do, right? I want to stick around. And so they start setting up more permanent settlements and kind of living here full time. Um, and, and that ultimately is what becomes the big problem later in time with the government. So um, under Spanish rule, they really were fairly unregulated because Florida was a Spanish colony. Um, they did make the, the, the fishermen buy their salt in Havana to take back to salt the fish. But ironically, the Cuban fishermen were usually the ones harvesting the salt that they then sold to Havana to then buy back. So I'm sure they were, you know, making it up somewhere else. But um, the British didn't worry too much about them either when they took over for a hot minute. 
And then um, ultimately, when the United States took over um, and procured the territory from Spain, um, it, it really started. Um, Andrew Jackson did not like the ranches from the very beginning. He was the very first governor of Florida. And um, he was absolutely convinced that the ranchos were harboring Native Americans. They were encouraging the enslaved people to run away. They were transporting them to Cuba. Um, and so the very first act from Andrew Jackson was to convince a bunch of um, Native Americans to come on down and raid all the ranchos and steal all the people that they could. Um, so he was very um, aggressive. But um, they also were a very profitable industry. And, you know, Andrew Jackson was a businessman and he knew that he wanted to get those waters for the, you know, American fishermen. Um, and just to put it in perspective, in 1830s, they were shipping over a thousand tons of fish per year to Cuba and selling it for roughly three or four dollars a pound. And in 1880, 1831, they reported $18,000 in exports, which today would be over 600,000. Um, and that's just a couple of the ranchos in um, Charlotte Harbor. That's not even taking into account all of the ranchos to the north in Tampa and things. So, I mean, they could have been turning well over a million, a million five in today profits um, in exports. So, which was, you know, kind of sizable for them. Um, where were these ranchos? Like I said, they, they were all up and down the coast. This is a modern aerial, um, just noting a couple of locations. But um, we have frequent reference to the Mullet Keys up here, which are still called the Mullet Keys. Um, and then several of these other ranchos, we just have very vague descriptions of their location. So um, Milam and uh, Rossi were uh, east of Egmont Key, which Egmont Key is out here. They were east of Egmont Key on the mainland. Don't know exactly where, but there happens to be a little island there called Two Brothers Island, and they were brothers. So I have a sneaking suspicion, maybe, I don't know, the name held over. Um, Buns, who we'll talk about again, had a rancho out at the end of the Manatee River in the 1830s and then out on Palm Island. But there's some mysteries here that we're going to discuss. Um, and then we have a few other general locations all along the Sarasota shoreline, right, between Bradenton and Sarasota, um, even down here to Philippi Bermudas and the fishing ranchos here, which is the North Siesta Key Bridge area. Um, and so we're going to talk about some maps and some mysteries for a minute. So, you know, looking back at all these maps in 1827, um, we can see here the Manatee River. But it actually turns out that's the Little Manatee River, if you pay attention, and the Egmont River. And we've got Long Island and Palm Island and Palm River and Clam Creek, none of which have these names today. Um, so trying to divine what they all mean. Um, but then in 1837, we get another good map. And this one actually notes right here, Old Spanish Fields. I hope, yep, there you can see. Old Spanish Fields. And so this appears to be the first like sort of mapped reference to the ranchos, um, because this is in the vicinity of Pacheco and several, several of the other ranchos. And so clearly they were sizable enough for these guys while they're sailing by mapping it to note that there's a bunch of old fields here that the Spaniards had used. And so they, they note all of these. Down here is Tempe Island or Caldez. And Caldez was a huge fisherman down in uh, Charlotte Harbor. And so, you know, he was well known enough to make the 1837 map, which was kind of exciting. Um, and you can see here some of the names still continue with, you know, now we get our first reference to Longboat Key. Um, and then we've got Sarasota and Palm and things as they progress down the map. And then by 1845, We've changed some of the names a bit and we've still got Long and Palm and some more Palms. And in 1856, a lot more of the same, right? And so you can go into ad nauseum tracing all of these map shapes and rivers and that's what I do to figure all this out. And it's fun to me, so I'm trying to keep it light. <laughs> but <laughs> in 1856, Ives also drew a map and Ives is the one that really gets us some interest here. Um, because right down here, which I'll point out again, he notes Phillips and Phillips is probably a reference to Philippi, who is a rancho that we ultimately are going to talk about. Um, and then up here, he calls this Palm Key 
which is a little odd because if you remember several times out here, what was Anna Maria looked like it was called Palm and also Longboat was maybe called Palm. But on Ives' map, he calls this Palm Key and it almost looks like there's a little river dividing the mainland from this little spit. So that spit out there where the, the very end of Manatee on the river may have been slightly separated and called Palm Key, which becomes important later. So, um, so just kind of some fun little facts here, but we got the mullet keys again and, and all of these lovely locations where these fishermen are. And in the 1880s, I know it's not in the best orientation, but this oh, is a fishery right here at the north end of Manatee. So it's in that location where we think bunts may have been. And then over here on the north end of Siesta, we've got Fishery Point. And over here is going to be um, where Bermuda's Philippi is at some point. But, you know, clearly these guys had a substantial enough presence that they're making the maps, right? They're not just a shack, maybe. They're actually a presence that is worth noting um, in many of these locations, um, which becomes you know, kind of important. Um, but why these locations? Just like real estate today, location, 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 right? Um, a lot of these ranchos are actually sitting on top of or very near Native American um, shell mittens or Indian mounds, right, as they're often called. Um, this right here is looking um, from Indian Beach Road out into the bay. And you can see right out there is New Pass, right? And so it's a perfect location. You're inshore, you're protected from the greatest of the winds and the storms and things, but you have straight out access to New Pass and out on into the Gulf to do what you see fit, right? The same thing with um, over here, this is Siesta. And um, so Fishery Point would have been around here and Philippi Bermudas would have been back over here, but you're going straight out Big Pass right into the Gulf and on to Cuba or wherever you want. Um, the north end of Anna Maria, I highly doubt the fishing rancho was out here if it was here. It was probably on the back side where these harbors are because it would have given it some protection from the storms and things. Um, but, you know, if there was a rancho out there, it probably would have been there. And then this is looking at that north end of Manatee River. This is um, the DeSoto National Memorial, which is different than DeSoto Fort park so but this is the DeSoto National Memorial Park up there on the Bradenton River and it's highly likely that's where one of Bunce's ranchos were but you can see it's a beautiful view and it's a nice shot out into Tampa Bay and then on into the Gulf of Mexico right and so um the Native American shell middens were there they were elevated right so the fishermen could be high and dry and have their feet not get wet and they usually had water nearby and so you know they can salt and dry their fish and they can get a nice drink of water and maybe some rum um, when they're not looking, right? So what were the ranchers like? Um, typically they were thatched huts um, for living quarters. A lot of them had anywhere from like 10 to 15 huts. Um, these are some later pictures in time, but they are supposedly few, uh, Cuban fishing ranchos and they are consistent with the descriptions that were provided of thatched roofs and thatched walls. Um, they would have drying and smoking racks or sheds storage sheds. They often had quite substantial gardens, especially later in time, because they're living here full time. So they're growing citrus, oranges, limes, uh, lemons, cabbage, beans, corn, all of these lovely things. Um, and then obviously, as they stick around longer, employ more people, they're going to get bigger and a little more elaborate. Oh. And so one of these very elaborate ranchos that we learn about is from William Bunce. Bunce was really the first European fisherman to find success in this mullet fishing with the Cuban fishing rancho style. Um, many later fishermen come along and, and end up adopting it, but Bunce was the one that was doing it at the same time. Um, but he's on the Manatee River and then later on Palm Island, which is why I said Palm Key becomes important, right? He moves his ranchos to get away from things. Um, but his rancho was described as having 40 buildings, a blacksmith shop, a carpenter shop, a turning lathe, a store. It had doors and floors. So, I mean, this was a this was a full setup here. Um, it was the, the whole shebang, which becomes very important when we get into the Seminole Wars and the other ranchos. 
Um, but ultimately, his very first rancho gets burned down, and then his second rancho gets burned down. Um, and ultimately, I think uh, he passes away, and the government gives his estate some money, but it's not really very much at the end of the day. So, but this is a picture um, of Bunce at one of these ranchos, and he actually had a stone or tabby building um, for his house. So it was pretty permanent um, in this location. The rancho workers are, are what really got me interested in the beginning and why we eventually get to skeletons. Um, the rancho workers were described as predominantly Cubans, um, which doesn't have a true definition at the time. But then there's also a mention of white Spaniards. So those would have been sort of the top guys, the head fishermen. Um, there's mention of blacks. It's, some are mentioned as freed. Some are mentioned as runaway. Um, and so there's a, a mix. And then Indians. And then there's Spanish Indians, um, which becomes a, a different group separate from the Seminole. Um, and then occasionally there was an Italian running around. I don't know why, but, um, you know, so um, there does seem to be a distinction in their discussion of Indians, which they seem to think are Seminole usually. And then these Spanish Indians that seem to have adopted many of the Spanish ways um, while still having some Native American culture. And it's likely these are the ones that were marrying the fishermen and having children with them. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about how early on that group began. Um, but in Charlotte Harbor, this is one of the few descriptions we have. There's about 130 men, half of whom are, are Native American, about 30 women, most if all are Native American. Um, and then between 50 and 100 children of mixed ancestry running around um, these ranchos. And often they would take these kids down to Cuba and have them baptized and like registered right in Cuba um, and then bring them back up and, and go home. <laughs> um, and then there were also a large number of both um, escaped, enslaved or freed, formerly enslaved individuals um, that worked with the ranchos. Um, Angola up on the Manatee River um, was in close proximity to some of these ranchos and they may have worked with the ranchos. And then down in Pine Island in Charlotte Harbor, there's discussions of them working with the ranchos off and on. Um, and you can imagine this becomes a big problem for them um, at various times, um, not only for the the enslaved people trying to you know live a better life, but also for the Cuban fishermen who were just trying to live a better life. <laughs> Um, but Sarasota has provided us some answers about the Cuban fishermen, uh, which I find interesting. So um, right here in Southwest Drive, which is in Cherokee Park, right by Southside Elementary, if you know where that is, um, is was Philippi Bermuda's Rancho. It comes up on several maps, which I'll show you in a few. Um, and way back in the day, um, and, and you can see it's a beautiful area, right? You just go right out Big Pass here and you're, you're out into the Gulf, and there's all these lovely fishing flats here. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, but back in, the, in 1983, they were digging a pool um, before all of the burial laws were in place. Um, they were digging a pool, and they happened to find a skeleton. And um, they finally had sense enough to call somebody. Um, and at the time, it was George Luer. He lived very nearby. And he came over and checked it out. And then he convinced Marion to come check it out. And um, so they were digging this lovely pool uh, and, you know, we have the, the stratigraphy, the archaeological fun stuff, right? And um, he notes that there's a bone here about 50 centimeters below surface and there was a nail and there was some more metal over here. Um, and then ultimately he draws us a little sketch that this was the skeleton with the skull up here and the leg bones out here. Um, and he made it very clear that it was fully extended. It was probably in like a supine position. Um, which is what we typically see in, you know, more modern burials. Many of the Native American burials that we encounter in this area are often in a flexed position, like the fetal position. Um, and so that's always the first question, is it a Native American burial? But, you know, it's fully laid out. And ultimately, um, George Luer and, and Marion were able to collect a number of, of the remains and keep them safe. Um, like I said, at the time, there was no burial laws. So they, they sort of held on to them. And then Many years later, I got to look at them. Um, 
So I ultimately worked through basically um, a, a forensic analysis um, at the time. So I, I have a box of bones. And so I want to know the first question. How many people are there? Is there one person, two people, five people, right? This is a mass murder. Um, so <laughs> how many people? Um, and then we want to know things like age, sex, stature, ancestry or race, um, anything about their life history. Were they murdered? Um, you know, so even when we're doing it for forensics to help the police, it's the same questions as when we're doing bio work to learn about fun people. And so um, that's sort of the, the steps I went through and I'm going to walk you through. Um, and ultimately, at the time, I used some super fancy statistics that I shall not bore you with um, to give me some answers to. <laughs> but um, these are the humeral heads. So up here at the shoulders. And I have anti-mirrors, meaning I have a right and a left, and they're almost exactly the same size. And so that tells me that more than likely I have one person, right? Because I've got a right and a left arm. It's not like I got two lefts, right? Um, the, the cranial bones also conjoined. They all fit back together really nicely. Um, and so that tells me I have one head. So we've answered the first question, right? One person. So that's good. Um, I was able to get some x-rays of the teeth and I didn't have the third molars, but you could tell there probably had been third molars. And the second molar, which is what I'm pointing to here is fully developed. So the roots are fully grown. And so that tells me that this person is at least 18 years old, maybe older. Um, and so, you know, we look at those teeth, we know what age they come in, et cetera. So he's at least 18. Um, and then we get into sex. And so, the very best place to look for sex, aside from your own bedroom, is <laughs> the pelvis, which is the second best place to look. Um, so the pelvis, because women have babies and men do not. And so the pelvis is the, the biggest thing to look at. Unfortunately, I didn't have any pelvis bones. And so the next best place to look is the head. And so, um, you know, men don't just have big bushy eyebrows. They actually have a big chunk of bone underneath there called a superorbital torus that makes those bushy eyebrows stick out. Um, and they tend to have bigger muscle attachments and stuff. And women tend to be a little more gracile. So we look at all these things. And this guy had this very lovely superorbital torus right here on the front of his um, eyebrows. He's got a fairly large mastoid process, which is this bump right here behind your ear. It was kind of big and chunky. And his little zygomatic arch, which is your cheekbone, extended all the way past his ear hole, um, which is more common in males. And then he also has this really nice nuchal line right here, this little triangle almost hook where those neck muscles attach. And so it was very clear this guy was a guy. Um, so that was good. I was excited. So we've got a guy that's an adult. Um, so then just to confirm he's a guy, we can measure a few other things, right? And so the size of your femoral head, which is where it goes into your pelvis, right? Um, the size of your humeral heads, we can measure all these things. Somebody did lots of statistics one day to tell us what they mean. And so these all confirmed that he was a man. Um, also, men and women carry their elbows differently um, in how we like hold our arms at our sides. And that actually shows up in the bones. And so you can actually look at the shape of the end of your humerus here, which is what this bottom picture is showing you, and um, figure out if somebody is male or female. So, but the pelvis is still the best place. Um, then we wanted to determine stature. We had parts of the femur, but we didn't have a whole femur. The femur is the best measurement, but I had to use the arm. It was what I had. And so we did a bunch of super fancy statistics. Oh, and it's covering it up down there. We figured out he was between five foot six and six foot one. So he was kind of on the shorter side of today's male, but still not super short. He was probably a good sized guy. Um, so we, we've got that, right? We figured out how tall he is. Um, we looked at his dental wear. Um, one of the big questions sometimes with dental wear is Native American. Don't think that he has the Native American patterns. Um, and he does have some cavities forming, which we don't typically see in Native Americans. Um, so he did have access to a lot of processed, more processed foods, corn, other things. But overall, his teeth are pretty good. And so one thing, that means he's fairly healthy. And the other thing, it means that he's probably still fairly young, right? Because he didn't have that much time for his teeth to go bad, right? So he had some pretty, pretty nice teeth. Um, 
Next, we get into ancestry or race. And since we don't have skin, which is also a terrible indicator, um, we do use certain features of the skull. So the shape of your skull changes based on where you live. So if you live in a super hot, humid environment, your, your nose changes shape to deal with that air, right? Or a super cold, dry environment, your nose changes shape, right? And then that affects other parts of your head, right? And so that's what really drives those features that we now use to determine race in America is looking back at sort of your ancestry. Where did your ancestors live? In cold, dry Europe or in warm, humid Africa or over in Asia or where? And so the shape of your head can tell us that sometimes. It's not perfect, but sometimes. And so we measure things like how wide is your nose and how long is your head and how big is your head? Um, in order to evaluate all of these things. And so I looked at all these features and ran all of my super fancy statistics. And ultimately this program spits out a very pretty chart and it told me that he was black and he was black and then he was white and then he was black and then he was white. <laughs> and it didn't know what to say. <laughs> and so I was very confused, um, but thankfully I had a good education at the University of Florida and um, I had learned that at the time, um, there is a category in the program called Hispanic males, but it turns out that most of those individuals that are in the program came from Mexico, right? And so they have Mexican ancestry, right? Which is gonna be a lot of Native American and some Spanish and things. But my guy, I think, is Cuban, right? Which is the islands, which is an entirely different overall set of backgrounds. They often have that, that Spanish ancestry. They have a little Native American, but they tend to pick up much more of the African ancestry because of slave trade and intermarriage and, and other things. Um, and so this is something we often see in the forensic setting in Florida is if we end up with these wonky statistics where the skeleton is, is going back and forth black and white, that sometimes means that they are um, of... Hispanic ancestry from the islands. And so the statistics were kind of vague, but they seem to suggest he's not black and he's not white. He's something in between, which fits really nicely with my story that I'm trying to tell. <laughs> um, so we've got a guy, we know he's an adult, but probably not too old. He's average height, um, most likely Hispanic or some sort of mixed ancestry. Um, and is he healthy? He overall, he's pretty healthy. He's got good bone density, um, but he does have a couple what we call linear enamel hypoplasias. They're little lines on your teeth, and they can sometimes happen when you get really sick or when you lose nutrition for a long period of time. But he clearly recovered because he kept on growing um, and became an adult. And so overall, he's a pretty healthy guy, which is good. Um, in the end, I did not find a cause of death, so I don't know if he was stabbed in the back or if he died of uh, shellfish poisoning, um, I, I don't know. I just know he ended up dead one day and got buried. And um, and it turns out he was buried in a coffin. Um, so George had collected several of the nails and they got them sent off up to the state. And um, B. Calvin Jones, the state archeologist at the time, I believe, um, looked at these nails and he measured them and he drew these lovely pictures for us. And he determined that they were um, stamped nails, um, I believe, um, but he, he gave a really nice time period for them, saying that they typically showed up between 17 and 1900, but by the mid 1800s, they were sort of fading out, right? Um, and so that tells me that this guy was buried sometime between 17 and 1900, late 1800s, um, which is kind of cool. And so now I have what I think is a mixed ancestry man um, near where I think there was a Cuban fishing rancho. So let's go to the maps, right? Um, in 1847, um, they platted all of the lands all over. These guys, these poor guys walked around with a bunch of chains and one guy stood over there and the other guy marched over there with a chain and they counted how many chains. And then they talked about the fact that they saw palm trees. Um, I can only imagine how boring it got. But thankfully, they saw Philippi's house and they decided it was worth noting. And so they wrote down Philippi's house. And so you can see it right there, right next to the 31. It says Philippi's house. And um, 
the X is roughly where the burial was when you sort of like geo-reference all of this and put it on the map. And so it's right next to Philippi's house, which is kind of kind of cool, right? I mean, if you had somebody die at your rancho, where would you bury them? Probably nearby, right? Because um, you'd want to be able to visit them. So kind of a, a positive in my favor. Um, and as I had mentioned in 1856, I also drew a map and he mentioned Phillips, which is Philippi. Um, and it's right in the exact same spot. So I know that, that we've got the rancho here making me feel pretty good about this. Um, but let's check out those, those incoming settlers because remember my nails could go all the way up to 1900. And so I looked up all of the old deed records and everybody that brought property in the area and the X is roughly where the burial is. And so you can see it kind of falls between two property lines right, which is something we would often see is these early settler families would bury in like a little family plot, usually at the edge of their property. Um, and maybe if you were friends with the neighbors, you might kind of put it in between all four of your lands, right, and have your little family plot. Um, so I was kind of like, mm, that's not so good, right, because we've got Susan Staples in 1877 and Richards in 1882. Um, and then we get they they sell it off some more to Elizabeth Alfred and and these guys in the eighteen late eighteen eighties. Um, but ultimately, I was able to do a bunch of reading up on all of these people, and all of them owned land, but none of them were here. So they weren't here living on the land. They were planning to come, but they hadn't come yet, which means they're not here to die and get buried, right? Um, and at the same time, around this late 1800s, we actually get the cemetery, uh, you know where the McDonald's is on B Ridge and 41? Right behind that is the Crocker Family Cemetery. And that is the one of the early, early settler cemeteries. And that starts around these 1885, 1890 time period. And so it's likely that even if these people were here to have somebody die, they would have gone up the street to Crocker to bury and not in their backyard. And so that's telling me that it's very unlikely that my guy is one of their family members or one of their servants or one of their their employees. Um, it's telling me he is most likely from my um, Cuban fishing rancho. And so... Um, so it was very exciting for me, especially as a, a naive undergrad to have this, you know, very exciting research project with maps and bones and to find a Cuban fisherman. Um, but this is the site today. It's still quite beautiful. Um, but looking out over the bay, uh, there's a big giant house and a pool. Um, there, there may be a couple more burials out there. I don't know. So but we couldn't find any right now. So as I said, an adult likely Hispanic or mixed ancestry, male, five, six to six, one, good health. Um, and it's pretty likely that he was associated with um, Philippi's Cuban fishing rancho there, um, right there on the Sarasota Bay area. So um, that was really super exciting for me. Um, but turning back to the history and how all these things play out together, um, as I mentioned in 1822, when we took over, Andrew Jackson instantly sent a, a big raid down and they raided all of the ranchos in Tampa and Charlotte Harbor. They hit Angola, they hit Pine Island, and they captured all of the, the slaves and took them back, um, supposedly to give them back to their owners and things. Um, but in the process, they burned a bunch of ranchos and did a lot of damage. And so many of those rancho owners moved south into Charlotte Harbor. And we actually see a lot of land records where they make land claims up in the Tampa area and they're making land claims in the Charlotte Harbor area because they were living in both places. Um, in 1824, the USS Terrier uh, was wandering around Charlotte Harbor doing things, and um, the captain said, yeah, there's some guns, but, you know, it really seems like they're protecting themselves. It's not like they're selling them to the Native Americans or, or anything, um, but I'm sure that they forgot the rest of that sentence, and they just said they have guns and they're selling them um, because, you know, it really becomes a hot topic. Um in 1825, General Brooke demands trade between the Spanish and the Indians to stop. He's really concerned about them running whiskey and rum and, you know, enticing the Indians to do things. Um, and the Seminole did sort of make some complaints about the Spaniards as well. But it really was 
I think the Seminoles recognized that the Spaniards were already not welcome, and so they didn't want that association. And so even the Seminole wanted to distance themselves from the Spaniards. Um, so it's kind of a little round robin action. But um, the green box, by the way, in the center of the state, that was the Seminole territory at the time. So post first Seminole War um, into the 1820s, this was sort of the agreed upon Seminole territory. This is where they were supposed to live and be left alone. Um, but as you can imagine, as people moved in, there becomes greater conflict. Um, and so true to form, the only two things that will ever get you are taxes and death. Um, the U.S. government did its very best to tax these fishermen right out of the waters. Um, they continued with the claims of guns and rum and smuggling. Um, they stationed multiple inspectors in Charlotte Harbor. Um, there's probably inspectors in Tampa as well, but I read a lot of the Charlotte Harbor stuff. Um, and they would live there and they would harass them all the time um, about everything. And um, but they did claim that in 1830, they estimated there was up to two hundred thousand dollars in smuggling, which would be roughly seven million dollars today um, that they believed that they were smuggling. Um, and they frequently ran their boats ashore and made them offload and count everything. And they always came up clean. Um, but, you know, who knows? So they also instigated numerous taxes and registration fees. And if you're an American citizen, you don't have to pay. But if you're a Spaniard, you do. If you have this, you have to pay. If you have that, you have to pay. We don't really know if the Spanish fishermen ever paid for them or not. It's not really clear. Um, but the U.S. government tried their darndest to um, tax them and run them out. Um, and that's a picture of the, the very first customs house in Key West um, before they built the super giant one um, that's more famous now. But um, a couple of the Cuban fishermen actually lived in Key West at one point and then moved up into Charlotte Harbor and then up into Tampa. And um, they were frequently through Key West um, doing things. I actually got to go down to Key West for my research and sit in the vault where all of the documents are in those little 1800s things and rifle through them and it was great fun. Um, back to Bunce, um, who again was a very successful fisherman, but despite being a white American citizen, the government harassed the bejesus out of him um, because he was friends with the Cuban fishermen. He employed them, he employed Native Americans. Um, and so they harassed him all the time. Um, and so they actually ran him out of his first rancho um, in 1834. He built the rancho on the Manatee River. And by 1836, he moves it to Palm Island, um, likely to, to insulate himself from land access, right? So that he's giving himself distance between the Seminoles and the military and, and whatever forces that may be. Um, so he moves out there in 1836 to, to whatever is Palm Island, whether it's the end of Manatee Spit or the end of Anna Maria. Um, and he lives there for quite a while. Um, and actually, he signed Florida's first constitution. So he was on the committee that signed the thing that gave us all the rules. So, you know, he was clearly respected, um, but he was ultimately mistrusted. Um, they ended up burning the Palm Island Rancho in 1840. And there was a huge investigation for trying to find misconduct never found it. And so in the end, the government just said, well, we were we were trying to prevent those liquor smugglers. And so that's why they did it. And I think they paid the family a couple hundred dollars to go away. Um, but so getting into the 18, so the Second Seminole War begins around 1835. And so we're starting to have all this fighting in the middle of the state, right, around Dade and pushing further and further south. The if you read through all the things, it's into Tampa, we're having Indian raids, and into Charlotte Harbor, we're having Indian raids. So they're starting to push them further and further south. Um, and, you know, as I said, the government is taxing them and regulating them and trying and trying and trying. But in the end, the military just says, that's it. And um, after the Second Seminole War began, and these attacks began, because the ranchos were right there on the water, they were an easy source, and they were obviously a point of contention, right? The U.S. government is patrolling them and checking them constantly. And the Seminole are like, they're working with them, you know, but then the military is like, they're working with the Seminoles. And so, you know, they're at cross angles. So many of the ranchos fled to Tampa and were staying at Bunce's Rancho, which remember was quite substantial with a, a blacksmith shop, et cetera. 
Um, and while they're there, many of the Cuban fishermen are actually helping the military. They're acting as guides in the end. You know, they're they're taking them along the coast and pointing out rivers and here's where you should go and what you should do. Um, and so they're helping them out. But General Jessup, um, who is a name I much despise, uh, one day decided that enough was enough. And so he captured all of the women and children that even remotely looked like they might have Indian blood, put them on a boat and sent them to Cuba. And then when all the fishermen came back with his men, he said, get over it or go follow them. And so some did and some got over it. Um, but there's numerous accounts of petitions begging for their families to be sent home. Um, Dr. Janet Snyder Matthews book actually has some really great details of some of the letters that they were sending and telling how long they've lived here and their families and send them back. Um, but the Second Seminole War ended in 1842, really pushing the Seminole further south. It's hard to see, sorry. And the little orangey yellow area was kind of the agreed upon territory at the time, which is right around Charlotte Harbor. Um, but it's pretty crummy swampland. Um, and then in 1849, the ranchers aren't quite gone. Many of them have given up. But um, Philippe Bermudez, which is our guy here in Sarasota, was still helping. And he was out as a guide um, and was going up and down the Caloosahatchee River, lighting signal fires, trying to talk to the Seminoles and say, hey, we want to communicate because um, we don't want to keep fighting. Um, but no no response. So Philippi went home to check on his stuff. And when he got there, he found a white flag made out of feathers and tobacco and white beads, which is apparently Billy Bowleg's like, peace symbol. And so Philippi left a sign that said, we'll be here at the next full moon. And then ran back up to Tampa to say, hey, Captain Casey, come on down here. He's going to be here. And so in early September at the full moon, they anchored offshore. And eventually, um, Philippi went on shore with some other people and they chatted for a while and they got the basics worked out. And then Captain Casey came on and they worked out the logistics and they managed to avert the war for a little bit longer. Um, and so Captain Casey, you know, got a bunch of street cred for it and everybody ramped up his name over it. And um, this is a lovely picture from Jan's book, Jan Matthew's book, um, sort of depicting it. And you can kind of see the little flag of feathers above his head um, and the, the slope offshore. And you've even got the little thatched hut behind him for his rancho. Right. So um, right there on the shores of Sarasota Bay, right next to the North Siesta Key Bridge. Captain Casey came ashore and negotiated a peace deal um, right there. So kind of spiffy little Sarasota history. Um, in the end, um, around this time in this transition before the Third Seminole War really took off, several of the ranchos basically got taken over as sports. So one of them was Bunce's Ranchos. Um, and then another one was Pacheco's Rancho, which is up there on Indian Beach. And so it was probably Pacheco's Rancho that later became Fort Armistead. And then now it's multi-million dollar homes. Oh, and guess what? There's a big giant shell midden there. So there's 3,000 or more years of history in that, that area, which is amazing. Um, by this time, they would get some of the rancho workers like, and put them on a boat and say, you have to help us. And the rancho workers would basically sit there and let them run aground and other things because they were so mad um, at this point. But Bermuda asked Philippi was a really resilient guy. Um, and he was married to his third seminal wife by this point. He's already lost two. I think definitely one to deportation and possibly the other one to deportation. And then he finds out in 1858 that his wife, Polly, has taken money and he is recorded as saying, oh, Polly, go to hell for money. And uh, so he loses her out to the West. And um, that's really like the last word we hear about him. He just kind of fades out. I don't think he goes West. Maybe he went back to Cuba. We don't know, but he just kind of disappears. Um, but, you know, his his area shows up a few more times. So the Seminole War, they averted it in 1849. It starts in 1855 and goes until 1858, um, really pushing the Seminole into the last of the locations where they are today, um, which they never gave up. They um, are still unconquered. Uh, they just are stuck in the middle of the state. But they're doing a good job. So... Um, all of this, though, has left a very indelible mark on, on history and the map, right? 
Um, so if you're ever out on the boat up in the Tampa Bay area near the Fort DeSoto Park and um, the Mullet Keys, there is a pass there called Bunce's Pass. If you read some of the literature, it says that Bunce's Rancho was up there. I'm almost positive it was not. That was not where Bunce had his ranchos. His were further south. Um, there was other ranchos up there, but they weren't Bunce. So he got a pass named for him. It's just not quite the right place. Um, Philippi Creek is um, just south of here. Philippi Creek is most likely named for Philippi Bermudez. Um, so the next time you're out there at the Philippi Creek Oyster Bar having a real nice set of crab legs here, um, look out at the water and think about Philippi. His rancho is further north, <laughs> but he got a creek named after him. So um, Casey Key, um, you know, out there on the, the south end of Sarasota, Casey Key is named for Captain Casey, most likely. Um, and so technically the peace deal was a little further north, but we gave him a big giant key so that we could remember him. Um, and then Maximo Park is at the very south end of um, St. Pete. Um, and actually, Maximo is the name of another Cuban fisherman. And so he was remembered. And there is a shell mound there as well. So um, all of these locations, um, you know, while maybe slightly misplaced geographically, um, allude back to some of this really interesting history of these Cuban fishermen um, that were here for a brief time period and in some ways did play some pivotal roles in some of the historic events in, in the country. Um, they were really a center of focus during that second Seminole War and a super hotbed of contention um, and, and, and ultimately, in a way, helped with some of the deportation by their families being taken. Um, well, not helped, but forced. Um, you know, and then they tried to avert the third Seminole War in a way and, um, you know, helped out with those things. So do I have, do, can I answer any questions that I've not, I'm 